Welcome again uh, to day two of the Solutions Plus Africa Regional Training on Electric Vehicle Batteries. Uh, my name is Emily Martin. I work for the Wuppertal Institute, uh, which is responsible for uh, the coordination of the implementation of Solutions Plus um, in African cities. Um, now, I think that a lot of you are already quite familiar with Solutions Plus, which is a joint global e-mobility platform um, to promote the uptake of shared public and commercial e-mobility solutions. Um, you can see here this global platform that we deployed jointly with UN Environment and the GEF program. Um, in Africa, we started with two initial pilot cities, Kigali and Dar Salaam, and this will be replicated in further cities. We are a very large consortium, um, including international organizations, research institutes, um, industry partners from the e-mobility sector, as well as very importantly, city authorities. Um, this training today is part of a regional training program that is structured in two parts. Yesterday and today we are talking about battery solutions for electric two and three wheelers in African countries. And we will have a second part in the first week of November that will tackle the specific topic of the end of life management of electric vehicle batteries. For instance, second life of EV batteries, recycling, circular designs, with a lot of case studies from different African cities. Um, first of all, before going into the training today, I would like to very rapidly give you an overview of the key takeaways that we had yesterday. We started uh, by giving a recap of last year training on EV charging infrastructure, um, showing the diverse solutions for different vehicle types, um, stressing key messages such as the need to avoid fragmentation in EV charging infrastructure and also the role that city authorities can play. Then we went into a very didactic presentation on battery types and technologies, um, explaining safety aspects, safety risks and also types of battery abuse, showing the worldwide variation on safety standards as well as tests. Then we uh, dive deeper into uh, the specific situation of battery charging for light electric vehicles and, for instance, the impact that uh, choosing the battery voltage class, class, class A or B can have on safety requirements and the importance to define effective thermal management solutions, as well as opportunities for light electric vehicles coming, for instance, from the use of components of 40 volt, 48 volt components from light duty vehicles. Um, then we heard about a very illustrative case, uh, the Thailand battery swapping platform that is currently working towards a prototype um, for uh, a battery pack, vehicle control unit, charging station and a control unit and system management. Subsequently, we came back to the African continent and heard about um, the partnership between Total Energy and Ampasan in Kenya as well as in Rwanda. Um, with very practical and very precise um, explanation on how to organize a swap station within a fuel station. So for instance, what type of fire safety requirements, technical requirements or traffic safety requirements can be put. And lastly, we had a very interesting standardization panel together with the standard authorities from Kenya, from Tanzania and from Rwanda where we heard about the existing standards and also the upcoming needs. Um, we discussed a lot about the importance to find the right balance between standardization. So for instance, on the shape of batteries, but also not hindering uh, innovation. So for instance, not hindering performance. Um, and we exchanged thoughts on future standards. So for instance, for standard for testing used electric vehicles. Today, we also have a quite busy um, agenda. We are going to talk about different aspects of batteries. Um, so management of the fleet of batteries, management, um, different case studies also and, and market options. Um, so we will have, for instance, presentation from Mobile Power uh, present in several Sub-Saharan African countries and Stima in Kenya. Um, then we will go into financing options for batteries and digitalization of EV fleets in a mobility as a service ecosystem. Lastly, we will 
address all these very key um, topics, very key aspects of battery asset management in a panel together with uh, three e-mobility companies from Ghana, Zimbabwe, and Kenya. So this is for the overview. We will go straight into the first presentation um, that is a more theoretical um, engineering ground to set the discussion on battery asset management. To did just to confirm that you can see my screen well. Yes, I can see your screen well. Thank you. Hello everybody, we are Natalia Arta and Gustavo Perez from the Battery System Team. At TDL and today we will talk about battery storage electric vehicles. Specifically, in this presentation we will focus on battery management system and recycling topics. First, the general structure and main functions of an EMS will be briefly explained before going more in depth about other concepts as battery behavior and modeling, state estimation, or the optimization of how the energy is used in a battery. Finally, an overview of the recycling process will be presented. The battery management system, or BMS, is the electronic circuit which continuously controls the battery operation. Its main purpose is to guarantee the battery safe performance, ensuring that it works in the appropriate operating window to meet damages. To achieve all these targets, there are a number of functions which must be performed by the BMS. Firstly, it needs to monitor all battery parameters, including cell voltages, temperatures, and current, the insulation resistance in the battery pack, or the status of cell protection components, as the high voltage interrupt, fuse, or relays can be also monitored. Using all the gathered data, the BMS can diagnose the battery state and calculate its parameters as the state of charge, state of health, or state of power. With this information, the BMS can perform other functions as electrical, thermal, or energy management, and other tasks as communication with the vehicle or data login. The BMS in an electric vehicle is normally built with a master slave architecture. The slaves collect data from its cell and module and send this information to other slaves and the master. The master performs more complex algorithms to take decisions, includes the current measurement in the battery pack and controls active components as the main contactors. Next slides will explain some of the aforementioned DMS functions. A battery pack is made of several interconnected cells where the energy is stored. When these cells are connected in parallel, they are automatically balanced as they share the same voltage. However, when the cells are connected in series, their voltage and state of charge changes during the pack operation and it can vary from cell to cell due to manufacturing differences or unequal temperature distribution. Then, when the pack is charging, the cell with the highest voltage limits the amount of energy which can be stored, and the same effect occurs with the cell with the lowest voltage during the discharge. This reduces the amount of usable energy in the pack. To solve this problem, balancing circuits are installed in the battery and controlled by the BMS. The balancing circuit equalizes the stored energy of the cell, so the available energy with a number of cycles can be optimized. Also, with increase of cycles and time, the battery ages and its capacity and power capability are reduced. This aging depends on various factors as the shock range during the cycles, the number of cycles itself, the working temperature or the current. For example, a higher temperature causes a faster aging. To minimize this degradation, several strategies can follow. The first of them is to reduce the usable state of charge limits so the available energy in its cycle is lower. But the capacity reduction will be minimized over time. To reduce the impact of high currents and heating, the battery cooling system has a crucial importance as it can extend the lifetime of the pack as at the expense of losing a part of the available energy. When the system is not enough to prevent the battery pack temperature increase, the BMS can also establish power limitations depending on the state of charge and temperature to reduce the demanded current or power and preventing further heating. As previously explained, other important functions in the BMS require the battery state estimation. 
is that the charge calculates the remaining energy in the battery, but it cannot be directly measured. Certain parameters depend on the state of charge as the battery voltage, the potential voltage, or the impedance, but they are also influenced by other factors which are difficult the state of charge estimation. The most straightforward way to calculate the state of charge is the current content method, which is based in the current integration to obtain the Amber hour throughput in the battery. The problem of this method is that it requires a known initial point to start the count, and as it depends on integration, measurement errors or changes in the capacity can lead to inaccurate estimations. Then, it is common to recalibrate the soft estimation in some specific points to reduce this incremental error. More advanced methods have been also investigated as the use of state observers or kernel filters to achieve a more precise estimation, but they require complex calculation, including the online computation of an accurate model to improve the estimation results. The state of health indicates the battery aging over time. Again, this parameter cannot be directly measured, although some parameters as the internal resistance or the impedance change during the battery lifetime. Coulomb content method can also be used to infer the capacity through the measurement of the transfer charge. More complex adaptive methods as multi-scale observers have been also proposed in the literature. We have seen that some of the functions performed by a BMS require the use of a battery model. A model is used to represent a cell or battery behavior, calculating the voltage response from the model inputs, which can be current or temperature, among others. There are two main types of models. On the one hand, electrochemical models represent the internal processes occurring in the cells, so they are accurate but also complex and require knowledge of all internal parameters. On the other hand, electrical equivalent circuits only relate to model inputs and outputs and do not represent the real chemical processes. However, they have a lower computational cost, so they are suitable for their application in BMS. An electrical equivalent circuit model has to be parts. The first one is a voltage source representing the open circuit voltage, which can vary with shock and temperature. Secondly, an RC circuit is used to model dynamic effects in the voltage when a current is injected or demanded to the battery. This behavior also depends on the state of charge and the temperature, so look at tables can be used to model the effect. Open circuit voltage increases with the state of charge. When the temperature rises, the curve which relates open circuit voltage and state of charge goes up, showing that the open circuit voltage also increases with temperature. On the contrary, internal resistance decreases with temperature. As shown in the picture on the right, the voltage drop with a current pulse is lower when the temperature is higher due to its smaller internal resistance. So I will um, now stop uh, the video because um, this second part, which is about um, the end of life management of the electric vehicle batteries, as I said in the introduction, that's a topic that will uh, that we will tackle uh, during sorry during the training uh, later on later on, so in the first week of November. So you will hear definitely more about the end of life management of EV batteries. Um, so um, this presentation, I, I am sure that can interest um, some of uh, the startups that may be in the audience um, with the more technical approach. If you have any questions that you would like to address to our colleagues at Idiada, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. They could not be uh, with us today, but we can definitely share any questions uh, with them. So questions and your contact details. So now we will uh, move exactly on time to uh, the next presentation, which is a very interesting case study um, from Mobile Power. So Luke, um, I give the floor to you. Luke, I think we can't hear you. Alors, je crois qu'on ne vous entend pas. How about now? Is that working? 
Yes, now it's working. Great, perfect. Marvelous. And can you see my screen in um, presenter mode? So we see it, but not yet in slideshow. Yeah, how's that? Perfect. Thanks. Hey. Hi, guys, and uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to talk about mobile power today. Great to see um, some names I recognize from Sierra Leone and, and some of the other countries, countries we're operating in as well. So, um, yeah, great to be talking to you today about mobile power. Um, we actually started out as a, a company doing um, energy as a service from batteries quite a long time ago, um, and we've been operating successfully across several geographies in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and recently, we've moved into to Inverti um, and, and beginning to develop some stuff like that. So net zero in sub-Saharan Africa, um, we're really about converting petrol um, run applications into sunshine run applications. So. Africa has uh, abundant sunshine, certainly compared to, to Yorkshire in the UK where I grew up. Um, but solar power is also getting cheaper. So, so why is um, the continent increasingly dependent on petrol and diesel? Well, here at Mobile Power, we think that's because solar energy is not quite as distributable yet as liquid fuels like petrol and diesel. And we're really trying to change that equation across multiple different applications, e-mobility being a very significant one of those. So why are petrol and diesel so powerful? Um, effectively, they're just very good um, because they're very versatile. Um, you can you know, run a small generator for a household or a charging kiosk, or you can run a commercial generator for, for a whole hotel. You can also put it in, in small vehicles and big vehicles. It's very versatile. It's very portable. Um, petrol packs a lot of energy into a very small weight and volume, and it's genuinely paid for use. You can buy a liter of fuel for running your Akada or your Buddha, um, or you can buy an entire oil tanker full of petrol. So it's genuinely paper use. So why is mobile power um, able to compete with petrol and, and, and make things that are petrol into running from sunshine? Well, we do genuine paper use and we match as closely as we possibly can those three dynamics. So versatility, portability, and paper use. Um, so we've got a range of use cases all the way from low household incomes that we're running um, uh, over half a million rentals um, a month across the continent, all the way up to the Mopo Map battery, which we've been piloting in various countries for generator replacement for households and compounds, and also in our e-mobility platform. And I think the thing that's really exciting about mobile power is it's genuinely pay per use. There's no long-term commitment, no deposit. Customers are able to just rent for, for one time um, only, um, whether that be 24 hours or six hours or, or whatever they need for the amount of energy they need. So how does a Mopo hub work? Well, we install solar powered energy hubs in, in communities, whether that be rural communities, um, way out there in, 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 uh, in difficult places to reach in Liberia, or whether that be in urban communities in, uh, in the middle of large towns and even some capital cities um, like Freetown in Sierra Leone. You can see some of my uh, colleagues and friends on the call from there. So we install these generation hubs we employ local area agents from that community who distribute the batteries to customers and manage the relationship with those customers. The batteries are secure by design. And what that means is that the batteries will only work with inside our charging ecosystem um, and will only discharge um, to the customer when, when the customer's paid for it by the agent. And then the customers use those batteries in a, a range of different use cases, all the way from phone charging up to running whole households, compounds, and, and electric motorbikes, and electric tuk-tuks, or KKs, as we call them. So we do that currently with two different batteries, the Mopo 50, um, which you can see there on the left, and then the Mopo Max, which is on the right, um, depending on, on the use case. <clears throat> so the big question is, why don't Mopo batteries go missing? Well, we've been going since 2013, and um, we spent a long time linking up all the FinTech applications that are required with the battery, with the hardware, with the built-in BMS, and we have our own supply chain. And that took a long time, if I'm really honest. But over the last three years in the countries we've been operating, we've been very rewarded with the fully integrated platform and being able to operate and scale that very quickly. Getting that integration is really important. So if a customer um, gets, re uh, gets registered with us um, by, our, by our agents, and they receive a unique customer wristband, NFC wristband. The customers pay the agent in cash, and the customer price is set higher than the agent activation price, and the agent pays us in mobile money, so that the agent earns a controlled and defined commission directly from the customer. The agent activates the battery using NFC technology on a smartphone that we give to the agent, and the battery activates. 
after the pre-agreed rental time, the battery will stop delivering power and the agent has 24 hours to go and collect the battery. If the battery is not collected in that time, then the customer and the agent get fined in various different ways using our automatic FinTech platform. And that means that we stay in control of our batteries. And um, as I said, we've done almost 7 million rentals like this. Um, and we're doing half a million rentals every month at the moment. So I talked a little bit about low-income household model, but I'll skip straight ahead to what we're talking about today, which is the e-mobility model. We've been running a pilot um, in Sierra Leone with support from, from the EPA and Shik Tunis, who I can see on the call. Um, we've been operating this small-scale pilot um, for some time now. And we've found that the, the Akada and the KK riders are, are able to, to have a much more sustainable business. So we're putting more hands into the pockets of the, of the, uh, the riders, which is really exciting. It's obviously much better for the climate and much better for the planet. And we have a battery recycling program that we, we have for the NMC battery technology that we're using. So we're managing the end of life of these batteries all the way through their ownership. And I think Mobile Power is very well placed to do so because we own the batteries throughout their lifetime and we control them with our platform. And um, so why is, this, why is this so powerful and, and what allows us to, to run this business model? Well, this is a screenshot of the Mopo platform showing the agent app and a couple of shots of the control platform that we use. This allows complete remote management of all the Mopo assets. So whether you're an agent in, in, in the local community, you're an area manager operating across a region, or you're the country manager operating across a whole, a whole country, or whether you, indeed you're a software developer sat in the UK, you can see every single asset, what's going on with it, who's paid for it, how that payment's working, what its state is, whether it needs recycling soon and needs to be ordered for collection and where those batteries are currently stored. So that gives us very powerful end-to-end -end management all the way through the business. That has to be combined with the battery hardware. Um, you can't just buy off-the-shelf batteries and do this. You've got to tie the whole system together. Um, and then the battery charging infrastructure as well needs to be tied into this so that you can make sure you're in control of your assets. And it's this pioneering um, platform um, that really enables our, our, our significant scale. We've patented some of this IoT, so Internet of Things, that allows us to control these um, batteries without SIM cards in off-grid areas. Um, and we're very proud of that. Um, so we don't require mobile network coverage, and we don't necessarily require very high mobile money penetration. And it's really a unique IoT approach that allows us to combine this with all the payment structures using existing mobile money and, and banking structures within several, uh, with several countries that is very powerful. And um, really, we see battery rele relevance um, all the way through the energy ladder. So as I said, we've been doing energy in households. We're now moving to compounds and, and e-mobility. But we really see this being right across. Some of our mini grid partners have, have, have had very significant upturns in their ability to manage their batteries through our platform. Light EVs, two and three wheelers, obviously, we're operating that for ourselves. But we're really looking to partner with other operators across the continent. Um, using our battery technology, we think we can much more quickly accelerate the adoption of e-mobility. Um, and then you're talking about larger holo solar home systems, attachable batteries, grid backup and UPS, um, really building the grids of the future in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that's one of the things that really excites us about the markets and the partners that we operate with in those markets is the ability to completely redesign um, how energy is delivered to, to customers and how energy is used in e-mobility or, 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 or in households. Um, and it's really this full stack approach that, that we think enables us to do that. Um, I think I'm coming up to time um, and I've touched very lightly on the mobile power stuff. Unfortunately, I need to shoot to another meeting, but um, I'd love for you guys to get in touch with me directly. We, we're always keen to hear from partners and we'd like to develop partnerships operating. Um, so do get in touch um, with me on LinkedIn. You can see me, my name's Luke Burris. B U W R A S, um, or do reach out um, over email as well. Um, and thanks to all my colleagues on, on the call who have helped us get this far. Um, we're looking forward to working with you in the future. I'll put my email address in the chat um, and, then, uh, and then look forward to hearing from you. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Luke. Uh, fantastic. So you can directly uh, get in touch with Luke. Um, you can also uh, write to us uh, if you want, um, if you also have any questions. Um, and I just a quick reminder that um, all presentations will be made available. So thanks a lot, Luke, for this uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, good luck for today and we'll stay in touch with you. Thanks very much.
Thanks. And now, so we will continue into further case studies. So we have very, two very interesting case studies today, uh, one from Mobile Power, and the next one is from uh, Stima Mobility. Um, so I will hand over to Emil. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Emily. I, uh, I will start sharing my screen. All right, can you see the, the screen? Perfectly, thanks. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Fulcheri. I am the co founder and CTO of Stima Boda. So, we are a startup uh, based in Nairobi. And we are deploying and developing the, the battery swapping technology to enable uh, motor taxi riders in Kenya and in North Africa to switch to, to electric uh, motorbikes. And so today I will uh, introduce you uh, our work specifically on, on battery, flat, uh, battery fleet management and how we leverage data collected in our fleets of batteries to build an efficient and scalable uh, battery swapping system. So I believe most of you may be already familiar with the, the benefit of electric motorbikes uh, for this kind of usage. So in our case, for, for the usage of motor taxi riders in, in Africa, just to, to remind you the, the big reason why there will, there will be a switch to electric motorbikes is that it is a much more energy efficient technology compared with fuel motorbikes. And uh, this results in much lower uh, energy and maintenance expenses compared with fuel motorbikes. And for Boda Boda riders, so it's how we call motor taxi riders here in, in East Africa, it is, uh, it, the, the savings are very significant because if they can make uh, two, two or three USD more uh, per day uh, by doing the same job for them, it can represent an increase in net income by about 50%. Uh, but that said, there, there are some barriers today that explain why today we don't have already electric motorbikes everywhere. We, we are a few companies here and there trying to introduce electric motorbikes, but it is still a very small portion of the market. And so the barriers that explain why electric motorbikes are not yet completely widespread in, in Africa. The first one is the high upfront cost of batteries. If you want a good motorbike with this similar performance and robustness of the, the current fuel motorbike that I used by Boda Boda Raiders, you need to invest in a good battery. And then the cost of the bike plus the battery would be higher necessarily than, than the, the current price of fuel motorbikes. The second barrier is a problem of, of charging times. Uh, if you tell a rider that he will get an electric bike, but then when he needs to charge, he needs to wait during the day for several hours before he can take a new customer, he will not switch because they need to take the rides when they come uh, because the more they, they ride, the more they can make money. And the, the third barrier is a problem of range anxiety. Even if you have, a, in our case, we work with a battery of a, about 100 kilometers of range, but even with this 100 kilometers of range, it's not enough for riders because sometimes they want to do 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers. In certain days, they want to, to work more because they plan to generate more, more money. So they don't want to be limited in terms of range. And so the, the overall solution that we are developing at Stima Boda combines three components. The first one is uh, the, the motorcycle itself. So we, we work with uh, our partner, uh, One Electric in India, to introduce uh, in in Kenya and in Africa, uh, a robust electric motorbike that is at least as performant and robust as a fuel motorbike. Uh, and then the second component is battery as a service. So I mentioned the problem of the high upfront cost of batteries. To solve this, this issue, uh, we implement battery as a service business model where the rider doesn't own and doesn't purchase the battery. So we will repay the batteries as the riders will uh, actually swap their batteries. And the third component, which is the core of our activity, is battery swapping. So instead of waiting several hours to charge the battery, the rider will have access to uh, our network of battery swapping stations to exchange an empty battery for a full battery. And so with the combination of these three bricks, we enable riders to really switch 
uh, to uh, to electric motorbikes uh, by removing the problem of the high cost of, uh, of batteries, charging time, and, and range anxiety. So now I'm coming to the the question of the technology. Uh, so. We, I, I mentioned that battery swapping is really the solution to electrify uh, motor taxi riders in Kenya and, and I believe in, in, in many African countries. But uh, to, to, to scale battery swapping and to make, to make it efficient, you really need to develop and invest in the right technology. Uh, because otherwise, uh, if you just deploy very straightforward battery swapping systems without any optimization, you would really struggle to make it viable. And so to make battery swapping systems scalable and viable, you need to develop the right technology. And this, uh, the technology we are de developing is based on, uh, on battery data. The key is to get uh, a maximum of data from the batteries and to leverage this data to build a full technology suite of battery swapping uh, that is making the, the system uh, viable. So in terms of hardware, it was already uh, mentioned in the in previous uh, presentations, the, the, the piece of the hardware that enables to collect the data from the battery is, is an IoT system. It's an electronic chipset, and it's, it's connected to uh, the, the BMS of the battery, the bat battery management system, to collect all the data in real time about the battery. So we get, for example, the, the position, the GPS uh, location of the batteries in real time, but also all kinds of technical data about the battery, uh, the state of charge, the state of health, so the, the voltage, the temperature, the current. All of these data, we collect, we collect them uh, with this IoT system, and then we send them to our cloud uh, to build the software part of our technology. And so the, the software part of our technology is uh, based on three components. The first one is a battery and a station monitoring platform. So we have developed a platform uh, um, where we are able to track all our stations, all our batteries individually. So we can track the location. We can, try, we can track the revenue generated by each asset. We can track the degradation of the batteries uh, because it's, it's very key to make sure that we uh, that we ensure that the, the the lifetime of our batteries can be can be maximized, and then we are we are also developing some system of uh, flexible charge in our battery swapping stations. Uh, we are also monitoring the safety the safety status of the batteries. We were able to send some alerts to the users to the riders if we identify uh, uh, an issue of safety on on the batteries, uh, and then we are also have other uh, other optimization that we are building you using the, the battery data, such as flexible pricing to do some, uh, some demand response for the, for, the, for the battery swapping systems to maximize the utilization of our stations in, a, in an efficient way. And also uh, we are using this data to, to select the best size and the best, uh, the best sites and the best sizes of our new swap stations. So every time we build a new, a new swap station, it's not a random guess, it's, it's using all the data collected from our fleets of, of batteries. And then we have also two other bricks, which are mobile applications. We developed a, an app for riders where they can see the map of our stations with the availability of our batteries in real time. They can also access their own personal statistics to know how much kilometers they make every day, how much they spend on swapping, how much they would save co compared with fuel. Uh, and then we have also different types of other services uh, that are aiming to make the job of Boda Boda riders more, more effective. And for example, one problem that we are trying to solve also is, is the fact that Boda Boda riders today, if they want to purchase a ser service or product through financing, the, the interest rate that they would get uh, will be like super high. Uh, most of the companies that are offering Boda Boda loans, for example, the interest rates uh, typically ranges between 30% and 50%. So one thing we can do also by collecting all this data from our fleets of batteries is also to better understand the usage of, of the riders on the platform and leverage this data to reduce the credit risk of these riders because we know uh, we know that they are coming every day to the station. We know how much they spend 
uh, on swapping, how much, how many kilometers they make every day. We can estimate the revenue that they generate based on the district they, they operate. And we can actually use this data to enable riders to access cheaper uh, fi financing services. And then we have our operator app, which is used by our operators in, in the battery swapping stations uh, to, to actually uh, monitor all the transactions. So they, they physically do the swap for the riders, they exchange the batteries, but they also record all the, all the battery swapping payments uh, that are happening on the platform. And so this technology suite that we have been developing and that is currently uh, the, the first version is already operational. Uh, the idea is that we want to license it to other companies in, in Africa. Uh, we don't want to, 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 to operate all these network of battery swapping stations and deploy the electric motorbike by ourselves. We want to build partnerships with companies all around Africa that can use our, our technology as a turn, turnkey solution uh, to, to deploy their own network of battery swapping systems with uh, performance electric motorbikes. And so the benefits of this technology, so when we leverage all this data from our fleets of, of batteries, the benefits, as I, as I mentioned already, is that we make battery swapping systems financially viable. And it is, it is completely key because if we want to scale and replace all the fuel motorbikes, we have to collectively attract investment from traditional energy investors, from uh, venture capital uh, investors and all types of other investors. We want them to invest in these assets, in these stations, in these batteries. So that's why we focus really on building the technology that will make these battery swapping systems uh, efficient and user friendly, but also financially viable. And so, for example, what's, what this technology suite enables, the first uh, thing it enables is to be efficient in terms of capital spendings by minimizing the battery rider ratio. This is a very important parameter when we deploy a battery swapping system is to make sure that we deploy the right number of batteries, not, uh, not more than necessary, to make sure that the service is reliable. Because if you deploy, let's say, three batteries for each rider on the network, you will have a very high investment. And actually, you can reduce this ratio uh, by, by working on the way you charge the batteries in the station, working on the way you maintain a good saturation level of your stations so that they are always at a high utilization rate, these kind of things. The other thing that is very important is to maximize the lifetime of our batteries. Uh, and I, I would explain, the, I, I mentioned already that we have a battery as a service business model, which means we invest ourselves in, in, in batteries. So the cost of the battery will be repaid by the riders when they come to swap. So if we have a battery that we have to change every two or three years, the, the daily amortization cost paid by the rider in the end would be much higher compared with if we have a battery that lasts six, seven years. So here we are using the data to prove to asset investors that the asset can, can actually live six, seven years or more. And in the end, it makes the battery swapping service for the riders more affordable. And then our technology also enables to make sure we collect the revenue on the network with safe transactions to make the overall operations of battery swapping more efficient and to ensure a maximum uh, service reliability, meaning every time a rider comes to our station, he has to find a battery that is fully charged and ready for him. And uh, so here I'm, I'm just showing um, an example of the screenshot of the current version of the, the, as the station and battery uh, monitoring uh, platform. So the idea is that we, we want to, um, to enable other companies in Africa to be able to use this, this platform for their own network of, uh, of, of, of batteries and, and stations. So they can monitor themselves, their own network of, uh, of batteries and, and stations in an, in an efficient way. And here, finally, so I have, um, I have some, some screenshots that can illustrate uh, the current version of our rider app and, and operator app. So on the left, you can see the riders can, can access the list and the map of, of the stations to, to know how many batteries are, are available in each station in real time. And they can also see on, on the app the state of charge of the, the battery they, they are currently using, uh, which is uh, given uh, directly from the BMS to, to the mobile application so that they can have access to a very accurate uh, estimation of the state of charge of, of their battery. 
And then on, on the right, you can see some example of, um, of what the operator can see using his uh, battery swapping operator app. So for example, when we record the swap, we have all the information about the, the price of the swap, uh, the battery that was brought by the rider and the, the battery that was given by the operator. We record all this, uh, all this information uh, into our cloud uh, to contribute to the, the, all the optimization I, I mentioned. And then the, the last picture on the right is a, an example of the, the technical data that we collect from the batteries. And so the operator in the station also has access to this uh, to this uh, technical data in in real time. So yeah, I think uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you, uh, everyone. And, and if uh, if they are in listening, some uh, some entrepreneurs or companies that are trying to, to deploy electric motorbikes with battery swapping systems in, in Africa, our model is really to to cooperate because we are many uh, technology uh, provide provider. Uh, uh, companies so you you can feel free as well to to reach out uh, uh, to to the team or, um, or or through linkedin so thank you very much for for your attention thanks a lot emil for this uh, very rich presentation uh, it was really interesting to hear more about uh, the importance to collect the data and how that can help uh, reduce uh, the credit risk uh, possibly offer uh, better financing options for drivers, uh, as well as more transparency for them. And of course, also more planning uh, to deploy further swap stations. Um, I think now that we will go into the first uh, Q&A session. Um, so I will now call my colleague Jacqueline to ask the first question. Uh, thank you, Emily. Good afternoon to everyone. So the first question is from Yusuf Sani. Uh, to Emil, and the question is, considering the cost of batteries, how do you break even? For an LTO model, do you have, do you have to ensure that the customer does not go into churn and consider the fluctuations in Forex? How do you ensure you break even? Thanks. Yes. So um, regarding the, um, the impact of, of the, the cost of batteries, so I mentioned, it's a battery as a service business model. So it means we invest in batteries or we have investors that are partners that are investing in the fleets of batteries. So they need to get the return on investment. So they will, there are several parameters. I think I mentioned the, the most important one. The, the first one is um, the, the ratio of how many batteries do you need to serve your battery swapping service? This is very important. So um, I mentioned, usually people think that you need two batteries per rider to, to, to provide a good uh, battery swapping service, but actually not, uh, it's, it's not the case. It depends on the charging speed, it depends on the size of your stations, on many parameters, uh, but actually you have to make sure that you deploy the right number of batteries to, to provide a reliable service, but not more than that. If you want to, to, to have your higher utilization, for your batteries and also the the battery lifetime is very important i mentioned if um, so in our case we we prefer investing in, in lfp batteries lithium iron phosphate because it's a chemistry that is a bit tends to last more cycles compared with alternatives we want long lasting batteries uh, so that we can finance them over five six years if you take a battery that is roughly 1000 usd and if you, if you can amortize it for five, six, seven years, in the end, the daily amortization cost is not so high. And that's how you can make, uh, in the end, a uh, battery swapping price that is very significantly cheaper than, than fuel. So in our case, in Kenya, we are selling the battery swapping approximately 30% cheaper than fuel. And, uh, and this revenue from shopping also covers uh, the repayment of all the batteries. Thanks a lot, um, Emil. So um, we will keep. We will take two to three further questions. Um, for the next one, I will call my colleague from UN Habitat, Kennedy. Kennedy, if you can hear me, if you can ask the next, the next question. Hello. Thank you, Emil. Emily. Uh, the next question is still for. Uh, Emil, and uh, it is, do you think swap batteries have higher intensity use and will degrade more rapidly? So, 
I would say not necessarily so so much more compared with the model with charging. I think the the, the intensity of the usage mainly depends on on how many kilometers rider are used to to making uh, to making uh, every day. And then in our in our case, um, we we deploy approximately 1.3 batteries per per rider. So we don't invest in so many more uh, batteries uh, compared with the model with uh, with charging. But it's actually it's it's a uh, it should be an objective to have high utilization rates of, of of batteries because in the end it's it's related to to your return on investment because you generate the revenue out of the number of swaps that you make from each battery. So you want actually to to maximize this utilization rate, but that means together with maximizing this utilization rate, you also have to maximize the the, the lifetime of the batteries and reduce the the degradation rates of, of the batteries. So this is very important. You, you have to, uh, in our case, we are implementing a, a state of health monitoring systems where we are able to see the loss of capacities of the batteries or, over the number of cycles. And then we, we use uh, this, uh, this data to try and identify which parameters in the operations of the, the battery swapping systems actually affect the lifetime of the batteries. So that's something that we are, uh, currently developing. The idea is to know what is affecting the lifetime of the batteries. Is it the temperature during charging? Is it the rate of charge? Is it uh, the, the maximum power that the riders are using on their motorbikes? And using the data that we collect from the batteries, we want to, to know uh, what are the parameters affecting the lifetime of the batteries uh, and put in place some, some measures in the operations to, to maximize the, the lifetime of, of all the batteries. Thanks a lot, Emil. That's really interesting. Um, I see in the chat that a lot of people have questions for you. I don't think we'll be able to uh, take all of them. I think we're just going to take one last question. Um, Jacqueline, if you can ask the, um, the next question to Emil. Yes, uh, the next question comes from Nyamwange Kingsley. Uh, and the question is kindly update whether you have insured the batteries. Any challenge in terms of value and battery life in relation to premiums charged? Do you have underwriters handling the same in Kenya? Over to you, Emil. Yes, it's a good question. Indeed, in our case, we, we always insure uh, our batteries uh, when we deploy uh, batteries and with battery swapping stations. So we have the insurance for the batteries is different from the insurance uh, for the motorbikes. For the motorbike, we use an insurance that is very similar to the insurance that riders are used to, to purchase when they, they purchase a, a motorbike. But for the batteries, it's another type of insurance that covers against risk of uh, theft, risk of uh, fires, uh, that, that we also uh, try to, to mitigate as much as possible. We, we have found actually that some companies are willing to, to look at financing uh, batteries in, in Kenya especially in the, in the new field of, uh, of intro tech. There are a lot of startups and companies that are looking at also at using uh, data, leveraging data to reduce the risk and, and provide some, uh, some insurance services at, at a competitive rate. So we are kind of trying to partner with this kind of companies, uh, intro tech uh, companies that understand also that if you leverage the data, you can also reduce uh, the, the premium. Thanks a lot, Emil. So sorry that we can't take all questions, but um, Emil, if you have a bit of time to stay with us, I would encourage you to answer to in the in the chat to everyone. Uh, there are a couple of other questions which are very interesting. Um, so now we will move forward uh, with a presentation on the asset finance and financing of batteries, um, which will be done by Lizzy. Um, Lizzy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Hi, perfect. Good to meet you. Hi. So I'm actually going to pivot a little bit away from specifically batteries and talk a little bit more generally about EV. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lizzie Bainiamisa. I'm a partner at E3 Capital, formerly Energy Access Ventures. Um, our first fund was 75 million euros, which we invested in solar home systems, CNI Solar, uh, energy for productive use vis-a-vis -vis solar power irrigation pumps, first mile cooling, last mile internet, um, 
clean cooking gas tech and metro grids and frontier markets. Um, we're currently raising our, our follow-on fund um, up to $120 million. And EV is featuring a, as a very big part of our, our strategy going forward. Uh, we've met Steema, we've met a couple of um, really interesting players in this market. Um, and I think while it is early, it is exciting. I think it's not a mistake or a coincidence that we see the confluence of this happening um, first in East Africa, just given the sheer number of motorbikes, how they're used uh, in society, as opposed to West Africa. We're starting to see things bubble up over there as well, um, starting obviously with the two-wheel market. Um, in Ghana, for example, they have a addressable market of about a little bit over half a million bikes. Uh, they've imported about a thousand EV vehicles, four wheels, um, mostly hybrid vehicles. But I think what we're starting to see is a focus more on the technology than on the asset financing of the actual chassis, the motorcycle. Um, I think the last speaker spoke to this, but there is going to be a confluence and some kind of convergence of technology in the coming years. And so as we're looking at this as an early stage investor, we tend to invest seed uh, to series A, we tend to lead uh, the Series A. So we have a board seat and we're part of driving strategy and uh, organic growth at these companies. Um, a big part of what we're seeing in the market now is most companies are coming up either with their own battery solutions um, that we've seen one company that has quite a small battery that's, that fits under the chassis where they've changed the jive train on the two wheel um, um vehicle, but they also have a small enough battery that it goes in, it can, an extra one can fit in the backpack of the rider um, that they can take it even further. We've met with Steema, we've seen their installation uh, swapping station at Rubis at Westlands. It's quite compelling in the sense that it's a very busy area. I mean, even before um, the shed was operating, you could see the number of motorbikes that come in there. I think that partnership with Rubis for Kenya is going to be very strategic and very good. Um, I'm an infrastructure developer. I built power stations and do transport for about 12 years before I went to uh, VC. So I often come to this from an infrastructure lens and being able to look at the asset itself in terms of its tenor, its longevity, the um, use that you get out of it, as well as the payback period. I think the, the layering over of IoT, uh, GPS tracking and being able to shut it down, I think protects the asset, but also makes sure that um, that ratio, the rider to battery ratio, makes sure that you get the, the longest life out of it. I think for us, um, you know, as VC, we get kind of, an influx of everything, everything from municipal buses to uh, vehicles for safari use, as well as companies that are focusing on the financing of the asset, battery inclusive, and looking to actually look to partner with a, you know, a battery company that has the IoT and the software uh, together. I think what's going to be interesting in the next couple of years is seeing kind of what happens past kind of the courier market. I think that's probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of uh, energy transition away from kind of traditional petrol bikes to EV bikes. I think given what's happening in the global macro scene, uh, we're seeing a number of countries, their currencies are crashing, um, we're seeing interest rates rising. And so being able to find a financing solution that is amenable to the segment of society that you're looking to attract, um, whether that is fleet owners or actually, you know, direct owners of these assets. These are all things that we're considering. But I think most importantly, looking at the addressable market uh, and realizing the uh, ways to extrapolate this further than just kind of a, a take advantage of the high petrol prices um, to get people to save, but to actually get their buy-in for this is, this is the way moving forward. I think what's also important about batteries is that we look at the their use larger than just uh, in vehicles. So companies that are thinking long term about batteries for generators, batteries for uh, vehicles. Um, 
I uh, just saw the question come in, as well as um, uh, just larger uh, applications. It's something that we're also looking for in terms of a long tail. I think that we also um, are very, very um, sensitive to responsible mining for the uh, inputs for these batteries as well. Our, our LPs are DFIs. And so this is becoming more and more important as we delve further into storage um, of any kind. And so I just wanted to give a bit of background of who we are, how we're thinking about this. Um, I know that there are a number of different founders. And as a VC, we always look for people that are dynamic, um, looking forward to people who can pivot. I think when uh, technology is quite early in its conception, being able to realize that you want to get ahead of things. I think we're also looking at people that have a, lar a larger appetite to potentially acquire um, other companies as part of inorganic growth, rather than trying to kind of take over everywhere um, as they can. And then also looking at social cultural contexts to make sure that they are investing uh, in markets where um, past this first big blip, there is a longer tail for the uh, transition uh, to the EV long-term. I think um, we've seen as well, companies that are looking at a combo of battery and charging, just charging by itself. But I think um, the nimbleness of being able to swap, I mean, if you think of a courier's day, time is money. So having to actually stand somewhere and charge for even an hour, even if it's fast charging, as opposed to just swapping out, I think is um, something that we take on board as well. And I think that um, we also look at the ecosystem that is required to let to make EV um, go. I think there is the actual kind of charging stations infrastructure. There are those who are going to finance the actual chassis, the asset, the bikes, as well as those who are going to invest in financiers, and then those who are just going to invest in technology companies. I think we probably um, live right now in the technology company side, even though we've made infrastructure investments before. I think something that we've learned from the solar home system space when we're looking at uh, financing for financing sake, it has to be more than just financing one thing one time. But I think the value chain is quite big. I think the tech part of it is probably the most attractive for us now. But as we learn more about the sector, we might be more amenable to invest in um, the, the larger kind of infrastructure plays vis-a-vis -vis the charging stations um, and uh, maybe even bigger vehicles. And so with that, I'm happy to take a few questions. I apologize, I'm very sick. Uh, Judith is a good friend of mine. I didn't want to disappoint her. so. Um, if I don't get to all your questions, I'm happy to email them as well. Thanks a lot, Lizzy. Um, I think thanks a lot for the direct speech. I think that's very refreshing. Um, and we learned a lot. I think I really liked in particular what you said about the fact that we need to look at larger use than just in vehicles. Um, and I think that also resonates with uh, the training we'll have early November on uh, the second life of uh, EV batteries for energy storage systems, for instance. Um, if you don't mind, we will have another presentation uh, and then take questions, or um, you prefer that we take questions now because you feel a bit sick and you prefer that we take them now. Yeah, I just see two. Uh, I see one from uh, Sheikh Tunis. Um, you would like to know the EV infrastructure support for startups. So as an impact investor, uh, we tend to uh, also have a rider fund for technical assistance. Um, Technical assistance can be anything from, you know, having an interim CFO to help the company grow in its governance and its processes and its systems to also providing technical assistance for pilots and testing uh, different parts of your business case. Um, and the second fund, so this fund is fully deployed. We're out of our current investing period, but we hope to have a first close of our follow-on fund in uh, late this year, end of this year, beginning of next year. And there is a um, there is a intention to have a technical assistance facility to provide support um, for EV companies across the board, not just EV infrastructure, but EV tech companies as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question. 
And then I see another one, uh, which asset do you support EV or EV infrastructure? And so, you know, we are still, I think it's still um, quite early. We haven't landed quite per se yet what we're, we want to invest in. I think uh, this is a new arena for us. One area we're really excited about applying EV, I think everybody's looking at the large metropolises and the big cities, but because we're a frontier market investor with metro grids in the, in the likes of DRC and CHAD, where these are large mini grids for a town, you have a wide portfolio of customers from CNI to retail clients uh, to, to residential clients, as well as kind of lifeline tariff clients, you posit that having a grid that feeds a town, that feeds productivity, you can layer other things like connectivity, EV, um, and other and, and uh, first mile pooling um, and things like that to add to uh, the productivity center. So um, we haven't quite landed yet on whether or not we're going to go pure infrastructure or uh, EV tech, but we are open to both as we continue to evolve our investment strategy. I think that was... Anthony, I hope that answers your question. Maybe just the last one on Ethiopia, and I think then we will go to the next presentation. Um, where is your availability? Do you plan to launch the project? So I don't have a project per se. As a financier, I invest in developers, I say, um, in actual entrepreneurs. And if they have a footprint for Ethiopia, we will more than likely look at it. Um, we are focus on sub-Saharan Africa. We do make kind of one-offs for Southern Africa, just given what's happening in that electricity market and kind of ad hoc uh, one-off opportunities that are popping off in um, off-grid that is there. But if we were to find um, a company and founders that were comfortable working in Ethiopia, they had the right connections, that is a tough market. Um, it's, it's very, it, I think Ethiopia and Nigeria are very similar, that you have to have a, uh, um, a local partner who understands how to navigate regulation policy and just uh, put together the stakeholders. So we are open to Ethiopia, but no plans uh, to invest in anybody who's looking there quite yet. Okay, thanks a lot again, once again, Lizzy, for this very lively uh, presentation. That was really great to have you. I'm sure people will be exactly interested in your contact details um, and get well soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll hang out for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, with that, we will uh, move over to the next presentation, which will be done by Paolo from Plus Service. And he's going to talk about a slightly different uh, topic, which is the digitalization in EV fleet and mobility as a service ecosystems. Um, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I will share my screen if I can find the windows. There is. So, can you see my screen? We can see it. Uh, not yet in slideshow. Perfect. All right. Uh, so, my name is Paolo Cantillano. I'm from Blue Service. We are an Italian company that develops a smart solution for public transport operators. Uh, and in the past eight years, we are working in a concept called Mass Mobility as a Service that uh, basically it's not in this case that I want to present to you, it's not about uh, Africa, but it's how we want to point related to this concept. Uh, this is a case in Italy, but the idea is that in the project that we are working in Solution Plus, like Kigali and Quito, we had to point to what I want to present you. That is the integration of uh, electric vehicles and micro mobility within this, uh, this mass ecosystem. So starting, to, I want to introduce why we need this integration, why it's so important. So then we will see this uh, study case with uh, applicated case. So, um, so the main two representative of a uh, relative new wave of mobility are electric bicycles, which have been active on the market for almost two decades, uh, and electric scooters, which have been experienced uh, growth in the past years. Um, these two types of transport belongs to micromobility subsystem that is specialized on the last mile. So here on the screen, we have some, some important facts, 
like the growth of over 4 on 4.6 million of e-bikes sold in Europe in the last uh, 10 years and how is growing the business of bike sharing between 20 and 30 percent per year in Europe and how we have seen popping up this e-scooter uh, scam as around the, the big cities here in Europe. But this is also a fact for the electric buses. By 2020, uh, they represented almost 60% of the total fleet of, uh, in Europe, with exceptional cases in Netherlands that is close to the 81% of the total fleet running in the in the city in the country. So the electric vehicles, especially for micro mobility. Beside being a real alternative to trips done by car within the urban context, they can have a large impact on the environment. Uh, for one side, and being an alternative for the, the last uh, mile trips, they can reduce the use of cars in the city and all the externalities such as CO2 emissions, the noise, the safety, uh, better uh, and equitative distribution of the space. And also talking about the electric buses, they are much more attractive for passengers that they associate, associate the, the buses with more comfort the noiseless and an eco-friendly aspect. Then the question is, how can we provide all this benefit to the user? How can we combine all these different micromobility services plus the traditional public transport boost with electric buses? One answer is given by the adoption in the last uh, 10 years of a platform called Mobility as a Service. Um, that is a platform that integrates different services of transport and service related to transport within one uh, platform. Uh, in a single application, in a single payment uh, channel that includes the traditional public transport plus all these on-demand services plus active services like walking, cycling, uh, sharing services, a taxi, car rental, um, the park and ride, for example. So the challenge is the integration of all these transport systems under this uh, platform. So for visualizing the importance of this, uh, we have this study case in the city of uh, Turin, Italy, that is uh, the capital of Piedmont in the region located in the north of Italy is between the border of with France and Switzerland. Uh, the stable part is that we have one public transport operator called GTT that manage all the transport system composed by buses, uh, tramways. And the system is also made up by taxis and e-electric e mobility. But they are still working as uh, islands without a bridge between them. Uh, so the Transport City Authority needed a way to complement the system created interoperable. And, and for this, we work in this uh, mass app. But how we do, how, how do you do a mass uh, platform? So for creating a mass app, it's important to come with a core. That core is given by the traditional public transport that is integrated to a standard file called GTFS. Within this standard file, there are many information, auto information of infomobility, such as the bus line, the frequency, the bus stops, the calendar, the fares, all needed to provide to the end user, that is the case of passenger, the best solution for go moving from A to B. But what about the electric buses here? The public transport operator can decide or not to provide the information within this file to make sure that the user will see the existence of a bus that is electric bus. So the user can decide uh, according to their preferences, what is the best option to take from moving from A to B. If they want the comfort of a bus, but maybe they can sacrifice a bit of uh, transfer within or they want to uh, go faster. But what's important in the case of the mass provider is to give the information to the user so they can take the best decision. This was, was about the, the buses, but what about the electric micro mobility? Um, how the different service provider can get uh, within this uh, environment? 
Of course, there are administrative and political issues on the table, such as the fair and the commission that they had to pay for the mass provider. Uh, what's the percentage of tickets sold that will be part of the commission? Also, the safety, who is being responsible in case of accident, the service provider, the mass provider, the city. We also have issues about the data, who's going to be the owner of the data, the, the user going to be registered with data, who, who's going to manage this. So all these aspects but must be considered, not only for the electric uh, mobility, but for any other uh, service that want to be included within this, uh, this platform. Uh, also, there are a technical aspect, of course. Um, this is important to talk when we talk about integration of micromobility. And this is a, a, aspect uh, to electric devices that become much more relevant, especially because we want to provide the right information to the user. So what is the right information to the user? So what they want to see within this app. They want to know the location of the vehicles. Uh, they want to know the battery. They want to know the autonomy that this vehicle can provide to them. And they want to know the fare, how much I had to pay. Uh, for, uh, what's the, the methodology of this one? I have to pay by minute, by use. Uh, it's a package of everything. So this is important to, to have in consideration. And when we talk about the API integration, uh, we have to use about protocols but they allow the integration and also to visualize different information, like the purchasing, the validation, the, the exchange of user, the user's personal data, the battery level plus the autonomy, and make the calculation of the third. All this is done through this API. But also if we want to have a connection with the devices in the in situ, we need integration of SKD that allows, for example, to unlock or lock the devices. Then for the case of uh, Turin, we have an app with a scooter service integrated through an API and SKD. So this allowed the, to find the nearest docking station, uh, plus the information that will be shown and displayed when the user click on these uh, areas. Gonna show information like the address, uh, where is it? The company, the autonomy of the vehicle, the fare, gonna have a, a button that will connect with the SKD and gonna unblock or block. Also, when we start to use the, the, um, the scooter share in this case, we can see in the map, uh, where is it? So we had to consider also an integration with uh, Google map uh, or any map provider. So all these are things very, very important to consider. Uh, we can see here the importance of uh, digitalization of the service that is crucial when the service provider wants to integrate into this uh, mass provider or mass uh, platform. So it might be a lesson for the new services to adopt uh, a smart system uh, such as GPS, uh, battery management, a smart payment from the very beginning. And it can make a, a difference for the expansion and escalation of the services. And also it's important to understand the implication of the API that are gonna be the, the technical parameter that will help to integrate within this uh, platform. Uh, conclusion and before ending, uh, so we need to understand the electrification of the services, very attractive uh, passenger, they, they like, and I include myself in this, we like to travel in electric vehicles, especially because we understand it's a, it's a boost to pr promote a green environment within the city. And this is another advice for the, for the provider, service provider, to understand that the digitalization has to be considered from the very scratch to avoid replanning. We know that in some cases when we have services that are not digitalized. It can be done in this way, but it will take much more time. We can provide even some tools, some web-based tool where the person in the station can do manually the, the calculation, but of course that would take so much time and 
right, will not be so accurate like will be in digitalization. So this, this aspect uh, has to be considered when we talk about the digitalization of the electric vehicles to include them in the mass environment. So thank you so much. My email is there and any doubt you can ask uh, within the session or through email later. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paolo, for this presentation uh, that uh, helped us enlarging the, the perspective. Uh, so going a bit forward than uh, the African continent, but I think that can be also very interesting. Uh, yesterday we had the presentation from Thailand on uh, the battery swap platform. Here now we are hearing from you uh, from, from Italy. I think what is also very interesting is to hear more uh, again about the importance of data and digitalization. Um, your presentation also helped us enlarge the perspective also to other types of electric two-wheelers. We are talking a lot about electric motorcycles, but uh, there are also other types that you mentioned. And I think to finish uh, the message that is really important to in integrate different transport modes, I think that's really something uh, important that should be stressed again. Um, if the participants have any questions, um, kindly put them um, now in the chat. Um, I don't see any right now. So maybe Paolo, you can indeed leave your contact details and people can reach out directly yeah, to you. Sure. Great. Um, and now we'll move on to the last um, component of this session, which will be a panel moderated by UN Habitat with uh, diverse e-mobility companies. So Judith, I hand over to you there. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I'm now going to invite the panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, just give me a moment. So uh, for the panelists, if you're able to, can you turn on your cameras? Let me also change my view so that I can see. So um, on this panel, we'll be talking about the key aspects of battery asset management. And on this panel, we're going to have Isaac Atia from Solar Taxi. And then we're going to also from Mobility for Africa, we have two, we have Rumbi, but um, I think it was, um, give me a moment. It was Gawain who's going to speak on behalf of Mobility for Africa. Um, and um, Isaac Atia, would you be able to turn, are you available on the call? Isaac? Uh, sorry, I lost you there for a minute. Okay, um, great. Um, and then we also had uh, one other panelist. We had uh, Kim Chepkoit Chep from Solat, I mean, from Ecoboda, but he has had to leave for an emergency. So on the call, I have requested if um, Emil, you could be a part of this panel and share your findings and also Wad Tanghe from eTrails. So I'll request if you are available to also be a part of this call. Yep, that's great. Yes, so on the side, I am I'm still available. Okay, great. Um, so now I'll go straight into the first question. And here I'll just ask you to, at this point, introduce your company and tell us about the EV vehicles that you're working on. And for this one, I'm going to start with, uh, we can start with Solar Taxi. Um, and Isaac, maybe you can uh, introduce yourself and your company. Sure, uh, thank you very much, um, Judith. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, the very first few sections have been quite insightful and uh, I'm glad to be here. So uh, my name is Isaac Atia. Um, I work at Solar Taxi Limited as a, uh, Head of Research and then Development for the company. Um, Solar Taxi has been in the EV space for close to three years now. Um, 
So uh, basically, our services involve um, the sale and then the rentals of electric vehicles, which involves both, uh, which involves four dealers, three dealers, and um, two dealers as well. So we sell and then rent them out. We also run um, a courier delivery service where we offer our services to uh, maybe courier, service, courier services. So we offer our services in terms of bikes and then uh, riders to people that run uh, career services as well. Uh, aside that, uh, we are also into the building of local uh, battery packs for two and then three wheelers, <coughs> two and three wheelers as well. Uh, so I can say that we are probably the first in um, Ghana to go into the building of um, lithium ion battery packs for two and then three wheelers. Aside that, we also try to localize uh, the production of some of the uh, some of the equipments needed for two and then three wheelers. So, like um, ESCs, uh, like uh, the building of electric control, electric speed controllers, um, converters, uh, and also BMS uh, battery management systems. We try to localize building some of these things here in, uh, in Ghana so that we don't always have to uh, buy them from or source them from external people. Uh, so that is a little about um, solar taxi and uh, I hope to share more as uh, the discussion goes on. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to Gawain from Mobility for Africa. Please tell us a little bit about your company and the vehicles that you focus on. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Mobility for Africa is based currently in Zimbabwe, uh, so Southern Africa, um, with uh, aspirations to be regional, um, focusing on agri well, predominantly agriculture and rural situations, um, electric three-wheel delivery tricycles. So we've got a three-wheel delivery tricycle, electric, um, with a relatively large battery, um, intentionally so both for let's call it the day-to-day -day range, but this in, inter swapping range. And then once we've got a large batch, we've actually got mobile powers. Um, so that kind of comes back to full circle on the, on the, on the, um, on the power and the rural, uh, the agricultural rural area. Um, having said that then, because we are going rural, we effectively have to supply our own power. So we provide battery swapping and therefore then all the charging infrastructure the resources, the maintenance, the spare parts. So, I mean, the, the word mobility as a service is there, but that it extends both from the vehicles through to the batteries, the battery swapping, and the day-to-day -day technical support of all of that. Um, I guess, we, you know, we've heard earlier today about battery lifing and the data and the battery management. Um, so we spend a lot of time as well on data capture, understanding that both from an impact, but also then technical and lifing perspective. Thank you so much, Gawain. And yeah. now, thank you. I'm now going to move to Wang Tang here of eTrails Kenya. Uh, if you could also introduce your company and the EVs that you focus on. Uh, hello, what are you speaking? Maybe you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, so uh, eTrails Kenya was created a few years ago as a rental of uh, e-bikes in Ngong Hills, not far from Nairobi. So we've always worked with a modular setup because modular uh, means it's pretty easy to fix, whereas like a ready-made e-bike usually is soldered together. So especially in our context, it easily becomes a big problem to fix, uh, let's say, a fully integrated e-bike. Um, some people, mostly hotels, uh, came across our bikes and were interested in what we were doing. So little by little, we expanded to selling. So we first started selling to a few hotels in the area. Now we've also added farms. And yeah, the next thing we are looking at is delivery riders. And when it comes to delivery riders, um, we feel that when it like of all the uh, types of e-mobility that are there, 
the lowest hanging fruits is always going to be the bicycle. If it wasn't like, even for the simple fact that it's uh, the simplest technology, and when it comes to battery power, it's also the least demanding. So on the one hand, we are looking at selling uh, to delivery riders. On the other hand, we were also looking obviously at the problem of uh, batteries. Uh, so I think even the, the, the most performing batteries will still not make it through the day because like a rider needs at least 100 kilometers autonomy. So we've been looking at different setups. And one of the things we were like, first we were obviously looking also at uh, a swapping system uh, that has its own issues. Then there's the, the whole idea of uh, doing fast charging. So one of the things we were looking at was a fast charging uh, setup. And when I saw yesterday in the group that there was indeed a discussion around batteries, I just wanted to share actually like what we see as one of the main practical problems. So on the one hand, you have a lot of, um, um, let's say bicycle, yes. Maybe we Am I going? going to the challenge right now. Just yeah, okay, okay. A round of introduction and then we'd go straight. We'll have other questions for that, uh, but thank okay. you very much. Um, Emil, I'll just request if you're still available to just introduce yourself one more time, um, just for the people who may have joined the call a little bit late, and give just a summary of the work that you're doing in Stima Buddha. Um, I'll also just encourage uh, all speakers to speak into the microphone, because we have interpreters on the call and it would really help them as they're doing the interpretation. Um, Emil, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Emil Fucheri. I am co-founder and CTO of uh, Stima Boda. We are a battery swapping uh, technology company based in Nairobi. We are currently uh, deploying our first batch, commercial batch of, uh, of 30 uh, motorcycles in, uh, in Nairobi in partnership with uh, an Indian manufacturer of electric motorbike. And our expertise is really in the, in the battery swapping systems. So we have been developing a full technology suite of battery swapping to enable companies all around Africa to, to deploy electric uh, motorbikes with, with battery swapping systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll go into our first set of questions um, to the panel. How are your EVs charged? How long does it take? And what influenced your choice of charging, be it direct charging or battery swapping? Um, so I'll go first with Isaac Aitia from Solar Taxi. So I'll just repeat the question. How are, they, how are your EVs charged? How long does it take? And what influenced your choice of charging, whether it's direct charging, battery swapping? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you um, for that. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we have um, a variety of um, vehicles, four wheelers, three wheelers, and then two wheelers. Um, so I'll just take them one after the other. So for the four wheelers, uh, we the main mode of charging is uh, the a, um, level two type of charging, with some AC type of charging. Uh, I think uh, those ones are able to deliver about seven kilowatts worth of energy. So uh, approximately it takes about six hours, five hours to. Um, to, to full charge. Um, so basically these level two chargers are, are, are installed at a place of convenience for our clients. Are installed at a place of convenience for our clients. So once you are a client and then you purchase or you rent our vehicle, you have the liberty to uh, let us know uh, where you think it would be convenient for you to install your charger. It could be your home, it could be uh, maybe an office space, uh, your apartment, anywhere at all. Uh, we do that. Um, so that is basically the main mode, mode of charging for our uh, four wheelers. However, we do try to chip in a little level one charger, which is uh, more or less for convenience. So the level one chargers are able to work with your normal um, 13 amp socket uh, that, we have, uh, that we have around. Um, so for those ones, <laughs> It takes a very long time, um, almost a day. <laughs> almost a day. We are talking about more than 10 hours here to, to fully charge our four wheelers. Um, but like I said, those ones are just for, uh, I guess for convenience sake, uh, just for convenience sake. Perhaps you find yourself in a place where there isn't any level two charger, but you do have um, um, 
a plug um, available, a normal uh, socket available, then you can make use of your level one charger. But predominantly, um, the, the cars are charged using um, the level two chargers. And then for the three wheelers and then two wheelers, um, yeah, we also do direct plugging into your normal uh, three, three pin plugs, three pin sockets at home. We have not yet gone into battery swapping yet um, because we are still trying to figure out the, uh, the logistics surrounding that in terms of finance and also um, tech, and also the technical logistics that goes into, into it. So for now, our, our vehicles are solely direct plug-in uh, charging. Thank you very much, uh, Gawain. Oh, and uh, let me just add up to that. So for our two and then three wheelers, um, approximately you can get 100% um, in about two, two hours, give or take. Yeah, so that is that. Thank you for that. And Gawain? Uh, hi there, yeah. Uh, so we've got a 100 amp hour battery, five kilowatt hours, um, and it takes five to six hours to charge on a standard 220 volt, as you said, 13 amps. Um, we, that's currently our current decision. We can, and that's charged as, as was described through a 13 amp wall socket at our charge stations. Um, we do have a, a, a second port within the battery, so we can double up that same AC charging. Uh, currently, we are consciously deciding to slow charge or single charger charge to maintain the life of the battery. And we're watching things like temperatures and battery life. Um, so it is a battery swapping model at this time. Uh, we're typically or preferably the charge station is at a central location where either the farmer would come to the market or the dairy herd, um, the, uh, the dairy herder would effectively come to a milk collection center. So the charge station is preferably at a natural daily or two daily collection point. So the battery charging makes sense. We maintain the charging ourselves again for integrity of the battery. Um, and in certain areas, we do effectively deliver batteries where required. So that's the, that's the current status. In, in an ongoing evolution of the batteries, we will be able to charge them directly. Uh, they're five kilowatt hour batteries and we can, they take a kilowatt each. So we can run those bat, five, effectively five batteries off a single five kilowatt uh, inverter. So the mature situation next year would be effectively five batteries DC charged. And then we can either swap them or effectively that then becomes our stationary storage. Thank you for your insights, Gawain. Um, I'm now going to go to Wad. Yes, so uh, for us, so as I was saying earlier, so we uh, assume or we, we observe that bicycles are the lowest hanging fruit. And at the same time, they're actually pretty uh, competitive with uh, Boda Bodas. And we all know that we have a few hundred thousand uh, Boda Bodas here in uh, Nairobi. And even if you could replace just one or two percent of those, you'd already have a huge uh, environmental impact. So we've been studying this for quite a few months now. And um, the most obvious thing to do uh, in order for riders to have enough autonomy would obviously be to do battery swaps. But the biggest problem we found there was uh, taxes. So KRA charges 35% duties on uh, lithium batteries, plus 16% VAT, plus what is it, the SDR charge or whatever. So already at the base, uh, lithium batteries have become really expensive uh, with the manufacturer, much more than they were two years ago. And at the same time, our government adds 60% to that, meaning that uh, let's say, how do you say that? English is not my language. Like uh, booking two batteries per every bicycle makes the bicycle yeah, become more, uh, more expensive than, or let's say the same price as two regular motorcycles, which doesn't make any sense. So from battery swap, we started to uh, examine a second option, uh, which would then be like once or twice a day, the rider does uh, a top up, a half an hour top up during a break with a fast charger. So the easiest uh, or the most accessible fast chargers 
are five amps and most battery setups are actually adapted to five amps were it not for the connector. So bicycles at manufacturer level are always treated as let's say individual tools. So most bikes, let's say most bikes below 2000 euro come with a two amps charger and the connector will be three amps. And because that little collector is there and cannot take anything more than three amps, you basically exclude any form of fast charging, even the lowest grade one of five amps. So yeah, one of the reasons why I joined into the discussion was yeah, to also hear the opinion of others and like how this can be overcome. Like personally, I don't see a lot of options for public charging infrastructure for bicycles simply because the manufacturers would very okay um we lost it there um, at the end what but I think, with my... yes but what you were talking about was the challenges of public charge public mm -hmm. infrastructure charging charging specifically for electric bicycles right okay Uh, what? Oh, um, let me see. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to unmute you. Okay, maybe just type in the chat, but what I, I got was public infrastructure. Let me type that out. Yep, that's what I got was the main challenge. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll now move to Emil and just to get your perspective, even you, if you had shared it, um, how do you charge the EVs? How long does it take? And what influenced your choice for direct charging? And if possible, you could even address, start addressing the question that Ward presented, which was really on public infrastructure charging, um, yeah, what are your perspective on how that can be addressed? Um, your company is kind of addressing that, but yeah, it would be good to hear your point of view. Yes, thank you, uh, Judith. So in our case, we for, for our uh, use case, which is uh, motorcycles in, in cities, so electric motorcycles in, in Kenyan cities, we decided to go fully on, on battery swapping. So for, for several reasons, it's also the result of the discussion with, uh, with the riders. Uh, the first thing, first thing we did when we started uh, Sima Boda is actually discussing with a, a very high number of, of Boda Boda riders in Nairobi, but also in other Kenyan cities. And we think the value of swapping is really, uh, is really, is, is really high compared with the models with charging. And the fact of, of being able to charge in one minute in, in maybe 20, 30 points of the city, it's something uh, very high. It's also very adapted with the business model of battery as a service. You can just include the, the, the cost of, of the battery in the price of the swap. So it makes it also easier to, to implement a battery as a, as a service. And in terms of cost effectiveness, as I mentioned in my presentation, if you really de develop the right technology for battery swapping, you can make it very efficient and the cost the difference between charging and swapping will be reduced very significantly. In our case, um, in our case, we deploy about 1.3 batteries per, per rider, which means that we have to invest in one extra batteries waiting in the station that will be shared on average between three riders. So it's not so much more expensive to, to, uh, to invest in, in battery swapping systems. And also the other aspect is that if you want to sell or to lease the battery to the riders, the problem is that they will also have to to incur a very high interest rate. So even if you need a bit less of kilowatt hour, if you go with charging, then if you finance it through the individual riders, they will get a very high interest rate. And in the end, the amount they will pay daily will be, will be uh, still very high. So that's why we, we, we did a, a lot of our studies and, and discussion with the riders. And we decided for our use case of motorcycles in the cities, we prefer to go 100% uh, charging and also uh, I can mention that the alternative of going towards fast charging, then 
uh, then comes the trade-off of, of the battery lifetime because the faster you charge the battery and the, the, the quicker it will, it will degrade. So for the riders, we do uh, full swapping and then on our side, we manage the charging. So there is still a pro like the, the, the issue of, of charging the batteries on our side, but the riders don't see any charging time. And for, for charging the batteries in our case, we are working on implementing some flexible charging so we, we don't use the same current uh, all the time. We want to be able to, to use a different power, uh, mainly uh, depending on the demand. So we were implementing some demand prediction models to be able to, to, uh, to charge the batteries fast only when it's required, which is in the, in the peak demand period, and then to charge them more slowly when it is not required. Because for example, at night, you have no reason to charge the batteries quickly because if you charge them slowly, you you are still sure that you will you will have enough time to charge them all before the before the next day. And then um, yes, so regarding uh, public infrastructure um, charging, so in, in our case for motorbikes, we see a bit more a model where different companies will deploy their own networks of uh, battery swapping systems. And, and in the case of battery swapping, there is a clear uh, question about uh, will the batteries be uh, interoperable? I think it will take some time. First, different companies will uh, deploy different types of batteries. And then for public charging, so we have seen in Nairobi, uh, it's, it's, yeah, they are, they are starting to be uh, several points for charging uh, cars uh, mainly. So it's starting to to become a bit, uh, a bit more common. And we know also Companies like KPLC are also looking at uh, at, uh, at deploying more uh, public charging infrastructure for for cars and possibly for other vehicles. So we are still very uh, early in Kenya about uh, about public charging infrastructure, but I think it, it will come, but not necessarily for the for the Boda Boda riders because in, in our case we believe the, the system of swapping will really dominate. Okay, thank you, Emil. Um, I have a question specifically to Gawain and to Emil, and it's related to battery swapping services. What factors do you consider when pricing the services for the customer, and how do you maintain the quality during swapping? Do yes. you want me to take that one first? Okay, so, so the, the pricing is is a tricky one and it's a balance between what's affordable and we spend a lot of time with our customers uh, both understanding what's affordable but also ensuring that our customers the ability to pay side and actually supporting our customers through their sort of business case of why they would use the hum the humber the, the the tricycle so so we, we to, to to some extent we know what the calculation is of what the energy cost is and then we have to make sure collectively we get that revenue. Um, and part of that collective bid is, is, is supporting both directly our customers in their choice of, um, of the business, let's say that they would uh, use the, the use case for the Humber and, and their financial viability for that in itself. But similarly, we spend a lot of time working with agricultural partners, um, dairy associations, um, livestock associations where there's an existing project or an existing um, motivation to, to, to work. So that the whole project is effectively supported. So the end-to-end -end financing, not, uh, well, the whole end-to-end -end business case of the, the enterprise of what inter whatever enterprise uh, the customer is undertaking is, is sort of supported. Um, and that is a challenge. And it's an ongoing challenge and it varies seasonally and it, and it, and it, um, and it also varies with, um, you know, people and groups. Um, so that, that's a very proactive hands-on day-to-day thing that MFA gets specifically involved with. Um, I guess the easier thing is sort of the math side of it where we know the cost of the battery. Uh, we know ideally the useful life of it and how we wish to amortize it. So we've spoken about that. And then we're really trying strongly to support all of that in the sort of the second life use. So I know you're going to do a separate course on that, but you know, being able to 
uh, disperse some of the actual battery cost from the immediate Humber driver and, and, and get that money back from, if you like, our business perspective alleviates the cost directly onto the driver. Um, forgive me, there was a second part to that question or does that cover it? Yes, um, there was a second part to the question. Okay, maybe I should give this one to Emil just because of time. That works. Um, yes, the second part of the question is, how do you maintain the quality of battery during swapping? So to, to maintain the, the quality of the battery, that's the first thing to, to do is to, to be able to monitor this, uh, this, this quality. So in, in our case, uh, I mentioned that we, we have an IoT system collecting data from, from the batteries, the technical data, and we use all this data to, to try and estimate what is the, the status in terms of degradation of the, of the batteries, because it's, it's inherent to the lithium ion technology that they will degrade. Uh, they will lose in terms of energy capacity over time, and, and they will lose in terms of power capacity. But then we have to be able to monitor the degradation and then to, to minimize it. So they, there is a lot to do. It's about how you decide to, to charge the batteries in the stations. It's also about how, how you size the battery relative to your motor. For example, if you have a, if you have a, sm a very small battery with a, a low amount of energy for a very big motor, uh, the constraint on the battery will be very high. So you will degrade the, the battery much faster. So it's also a lot of work on the selection of the, the technology, the battery pack. Everything in the battery pack is important. The, 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 pack, the pack itself, the thermal management, the, the battery management system. So there is a lot to do when you source the technology because if you if you go into one choice of battery and then you realize after one year that you have to replace them every year, then all your business model doesn't work and you have to start again doing all the all, all the sourcing. So it's it's very important to first uh, take some time to source the good technology and not take the cheapest option because we we can imagine that the cheapest option on the market may not be the, the one that will last. The, the longer because there are some savings on different types of components. Uh, and then in the operations, in the operations, yeah, you can, you can, uh, you can, for example, check the, the temperature inside the, inside the stations. It's, it's quite a, an important factor, the, the way you, you charge the batteries and, and these kind of, uh, of parameters. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I can see word that you are now unmuted. Um, so the question that we, I'll just ask different questions just because of the time as we go forward. So the question I would like to ask to word is, um, you did mention that you have been doing, um, you did mention some challenges with battery swapping and that's what you are currently implementing, right? No, so for us, we only sell the vehicle, the mm -hmm. e-bike. Okay. So then um, in order to reach the delivery guys, we see that they need more autonomy than just one battery. So here we come then to this discussion. And then we see two options. On the one hand, you have the battery swapping model, but what blocked us there was taxes. So okay. lithium batteries are the most taxed objects basically in the entire like list of, uh, of duties of KRA. So it's 35% plus 60% VAT plus a whole bunch of other costs. So you're talking about 60% on top of the buying price and on top of transport and everything. So that makes it very hard to have an economically sustainable swapping model. Mm -hmm. So then we were looking at public charging infrastructure. And then we see what some of the other people were saying. Also, every battery has its own properties. And you can think you have the right battery for a particular type of charger. But at the very last moment, you realize that something stupid like a, a small plastic connector suddenly makes it not feasible anymore and makes it actually d d dangerous to use means that swapping infrastructure um i mean uh public charging infrastructure can work very well for cars where everything is standardized but for two-wheeled vehicles it's actually very dangerous because if the batteries that people bring to the charging infrastructure are not compatible you're just going to create a fire okay Thank you for that. Um, and now this leads me to my final question, which I would request you to answer rapidly. 
Um, it's a big question, like all the questions on this panel, but I would encourage you if you could take 30 seconds and I could get your thoughts. And the question I'm going to ask is very similar to the question that John Singo has posted on the chat. Um, the African market is pretty small and fragmented with different providers trying out their different, uh, different ways to charge. Um, is there a way that interoperability possible and what do you foresee from where you sit? I'm going to start with Isaac Atia from Solar Taxi. It would be great to hear your thoughts from on that. 30 seconds, repeat fire. Hi, sorry, can you, can you come again? I think I lost you there. Uh, okay, so the question is, um, do you think that there is a opportunity for interoperability since um, our, the markets are fragmented, especially when it comes to EVs, different companies are trying out different ways of setting up charging infrastructure, uh, what, what's your view on interoperability of charging and charging infrastructure? Okay, uh, right. So yeah, it, it is true, uh, just like uh, the last person said that, um, uh, just like the last person said, um, two wheelers and then three wheelers, uh, when it comes to two wheelers and then three wheelers, uh, charging is not very standardized, unlike uh, four wheelers, unlike cars. So because of that, everyone is trying to come up with their own ways uh, under the guise that it is safe or, or it is better for their use case. Uh, but I do think that once we come up, it is it is up to us to come up with uh, probably better policies and then better regulations on that front. Why? Because uh, I think the whole point of um, uh, interoperability uh, becomes becomes relevant when we are able to come up with a system, when we are able to put systems in place to dictate how charging should be done. Because once we come up with those policies, then we will be able to tell that, okay, battery A should be able to work with, let's say, systems of battery D, or battery B should be able to work with systems of a, of a, of a battery C. So uh, I think it's up to the big players in two and then three wheeler EVs in Africa to probably come together and then come up with a, a much more, uh, let me say, structured way of um, of going out, of going about building charging infrastructure. Because, um, for example, I'm in Ghana. We build um, battery packs for clients in Ghana, and then um, some time ago we had people in uh, Togo and then Burkina Faso requesting for vehicles from us. Which means that if there were another um, EV company in um, Cote d'Ivoire or let me say in Togo who probably had their own charging infrastructure, it would be up to us here in Solar Taxi to make sure that whatever batteries we use would fit in their ecosystem. But then how do we do that if we are not in, um, how do I put, let's say in constant talks with them? How do we do that if there are no docu supporting documents to let us know that, hey, these guys are into what is what they do. So if you are building battery packs, make sure that it follows some kind of um, standard so that whenever somebody who is not in my region purchases that like the guy who was in Togo, they should be able to charge it over, over there. So interoperability, yes, is an option, but then again, that only becomes feasible when the big players in the market are able to come together and then come, come up with a consensus that, okay, um, let's follow these, uh, let's follow this procedure A, B, and C, and then following these procedures, we should be able to, uh, we should be able to make a, a much more interoperable system. Uh, that's, that's my take on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, due to time, I would go through to the whole panel to get your different perspectives, but it's been really great for all of you sharing your different perspectives, your different challenges and your different approach, approaches to enriching the conversation. Um, I see that there are two hands up. I would encourage the participants to type those questions and we can follow up with the different panelists and they can give answers and we can share the answers with you. At this point, I want to hand over back to Emily, who will take us, um, who will just give a, a summary of today and the plans, the next steps. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Judith, for this very rich uh, discussion. I think that was much appreciated to have this uh, more relaxed conversation about the different strategies. I think that was really helpful. Um, so I'm not going to give a, an overview in the interest of time. I think we touched upon a lot of different topics from data to battery management to funding and to uh, many other aspects. Um, I just want to uh, remind you that the presentations will be uh, made available online as well as a recording. 
Um, don't hesitate to contact us if you have uh, any questions in general. I will now show you uh, the second part of the training that will take place in the first week of November, on the first and the second uh, of November, um, on the topic of the end of life management of EV batteries. Um, so we will have one day where we are going to hear about very interesting case studies uh, from South Africa, from Rwanda, with two different cases studies from uh, batteries in Germany as well as in Asia. And we are going to cover the entire value chain of the end-of-life management of EV batteries uh, coming from uh, refurbishing, repurposing a second life, recycling and circular design. Um, and we will address the technical and financial feasibility for end-of-life management together with uh, all these companies and uh, UN Habitat again. Um, on the second day, we are going to look a bit more into the policy aspects of enabling uh, an easier end of life management. Um, so we'll have uh, presentations around policies that can facilitate this end of life management um, and look specifically at the situation in Kenya and Rwanda. Um, we will also have uh, dedicated breakout room sessions where we'll do an interactive mapping exercise because the idea is there is really not only that we uh, listen to each other, but also that we try to produce something jointly. So where we see, okay, where are the gaps? Uh, what are possible policy answers? Um, so that will be really interesting to have both public authorities, international organizations, research organizations, and obviously companies. Um, so we really encourage to, uh, you to attend these uh, two days. So that, that is for today. Um, many thanks for being uh, here with us. Uh, warm thanks. Hope to see you uh, in uh, now two weeks and uh, have a great afternoon.